So what I'd like to do today is to talk about the big picture. And I'm actually, ironically, going to start with the planet and then eventually get down to the nanometer scale at the end of the talk. So it kind of covers about 15 orders of magnitude as far as spatial size goes. So this spatial eat your heart out. Um, and um, <laughs> you know, what I want to do today is to talk about several things. Um, I want to start with talking about and kind of probably going back a little bit to the, uh, to the ocean atmosphere hydrologic system uh, with respect to oxygen isotope geochemistry of the ocean. And uh, it becomes really fundamental to understand that if you want to look back at climate and you want to look back at uh, what happens in past ice ages. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Move on to the carbon system, the inorganic carbon system. I'm not going to deal with the organic system. I think Brian, Brian Pope's going to do that. And uh, then I want to take a look sort of at the physical sense of how the oceans operate and how you can link up the, what you learn about, what we, what we learn about the way the system operates and understand the, literally the, the flow paths and why the ocean's chemistry looks the way it does from carbon isotope space. And finally, uh, move on to uh, Oxygen and carbon isotope geochemistry of carbonates. Um, from both the organism point of view, I work on a critical foraminifera. They're marine protozoa. Um, and they're very amenable to uh, experimental research, as you'll see, and how we wind up scuba diving for them all the time. And then the, la the last part of the talk is something that I like to talk about, which is sort of the 21st century frontier. Um, over the last decade, I've started focusing my energies into exploring new technologies that combine really beautifully with stable isotope geochemistry. And I'll show you some of the examples of things that we're doing now that we're just writing up the papers for. And uh, there's some really exciting opportunities on the horizon. I, I see the funding agencies, they're, they're still in the wow stage of this is really cool, we'll fund this, okay, because of the potential. So something to think about as you move through your careers. Okay, so um, let's start with something that I know that uh, has already been covered, but I want to just quickly go over it again. So if we look at the hydrologic system, especially linked to the ocean, of course, pretty much the ocean's geochemistry varies, at least the surface geochemistry, only varies by a couple of per mil, centered around SMO. Um, evaporation gives you water vapor, all right, that's depleted in oxygen 18. And as your storm systems and your water vapor moves up over the continents, okay, you start losing uh, the heavier isotopes. Okay, you, basically you're getting your water that's now more and more depleted in oxygen 18 until finally we get up into mountain regions or we move on to high latitude regions and we wind up with really depleted oxygen isotope values for, uh, for uh, water vapor or rainfall. And this is just, uh, I think you've all seen this already, right? The classic Rayleigh fractionation curve, where you can see that the, initially the delta O18 of the ocean around zero, SMO, uh, first evap evaporation, um, something like minus 10 per mil in the water vapor, and the rain that falls around Hawaii and Fiji is around minus three. Okay, this is something that if you want to spend a lot of money for water, out of a bottle and you go for Fiji and Hawaii, all you're doing is getting enriched O18 water relative to everything else that you could buy. Um, one of the interesting things about this, and this is sort of where you know, my field intersects with the fundamentals of the hydrologic system, is what happens at the high latitudes and also through time when we have continental glaciations. And that is that if you take a look at, at um, your water sources offshore, and those uh, storm systems that move up onto, say, Antarctica, you know, by the time the water falls as snow and accumulates as ice, you've got about a 5% depletion in oxygen 18. And we start to see delta O18 values, a slap is uh, minus 55 per mil, standard light Antarctic precipitate. And you can see how light the hydrogen isotope values are. And this has a fundamental effect on ocean geochemistry. Not because of the fact that you know, we have a 5% change, but because we can literally pull perhaps 3% of the ocean water out of the ocean and dump it up on continents during glacial times. Now, we take a look at Antarctica, okay, we see something in the minus 50 per mil thereabouts, okay, but 
What's interesting about this is that the delta O18 and the delta D of the ice that accumulates in various places like Greenland, Antarctica, mountain glaciers, shows a beautiful relationship to mean annual air temperature. So the geochemistry of the ice gives us an environmental signal that we can effectively link to what's happening over these continental ice sheets and over mountain glaciers even. Of course, this is first order. There's a lot of other processes that affect the delta O18 of that snow that's falling, everything from relative humidity, okay, also sublimation, things like that. But in a general sense, the geochemical community that works on the past has a target. We have a, we have a really nice calibration that allows us to figure out what the planet's atmosphere was like in various areas okay, in times past by looking at the geochemistry of, of um, the continental ice. Now, as I was saying, when you go to glacial times, what we find is that effectively as you're evaporating and removing, uh, preferentially removing H2.16O 16 out of the ocean and moving up in the ice sheets, all right, we start accumulating ice in places that they don't exist today. For instance, North America was covered with a huge ice sheet uh, 18,000 years ago where we, you know, the, the front of the ice sheet went down to Long Island, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, all of northern Europe was covered by an ice sheet. Jim and I and uh, our wives had a, Edna and, and Charlene had an opportunity to go over to Nor Norway to uh, look at the Norwegian fjords and I, I think I can say that as much as I've worked on ice in, in the past, I was still stunned standing at the top of a fjord that's a thousand feet deep. It's now above, above water and you're just looking at this valley that goes out and it was all filled with ice. So huge amounts of ice and effectively what that did was to drop sea level by 100 to 120 meters 18,000 years ago. Okay, so your coastlines were well, well, well for, out, out into the ocean relative to today. And the geochemistry of the entire ocean, okay, wound up increasing by about 1 to 1.2 per mil, just by removing all that water. And we'll come back to this because this becomes our um, way of getting at past glaciations in Earth history. All right, looking at changes in the geochemistry of the ocean as ice moves on and off the continents and the, uh, the water is fractionated. Okay, so... In summary, we're looking at a number of different um, uh, water sources and transport mechanisms that give us uh, oxygen isotope variability from SMO up to the ice sheets and precipitation. It's really a valuable way of getting at what the planet was like in the past. Now, from the ocean point of view, uh, we have actually a very different type of uh, uh, conceptual problem to deal with, and that is that Today, the entire ocean surface is not smooth. It's a bit of variability. And that variability is linked to atmospheric circulation. Very, very clearly. So let's do a quick review of atmospheric circulation. Okay, if we look at the planet, here's the equator. We pretty much have three atmospheric circulation cells. Between the equator and about 30 degrees latitude, we have the Hadley cell from 30 to 60, the Ferrell cell, and then from 60 to 90, the polar cell. But understand those are not concentric circles or boundaries at those latitudes. It's the jet streams that meander back and forth that form the boundaries between the Hadley cell and the Ferrell and the Ferrell and the polar cell. Now, uh, air rises at the equator. It's hot, it's humid. You wind up with low pressure systems along the equator. Air rises, you get a lot of precipitation. That's our intertropical convergence zone, the ITCZ. And the air then flows south and north from that point, and as it does, it loses water vapor, okay? The air becomes denser and it sinks, and it winds up sinking at around 30 degrees latitude. That's your desert belt, okay? So you wind up with air sinking around 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south, and then the air flows back near the surface towards the equator, picking up water vapor again if it's flowing across the ocean. Similarly, the air that's now flowing at 30 degrees that flows northward, Okay, it also is picking up water vapor as it flows along the ocean. And then when it gets up to about 60, all right, it's accumulated enough water vapor, it rises and you get another low pressure system. So here's our North Pacific low up here, and of course the ITCZ and our desert belt. Now, because of Coriolis, the winds are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and the left in the southern hemisphere, 
Okay, so I'm going to do the westerlies because it's more obvious here. So the winds that are flowing to the north here are deflected to the right, and you get winds coming out of the west. Those are your westerlies. In the southern hemisphere, the winds that are flowing southward, they're deflected to the left. You get the westerlies. Same thing because it's deflected from the direction they're coming. So if you look at the Hadley cell in the southern hemisphere, the winds are flowing in towards the equator. They're deflected to the left. You wind up with the southeast trade winds. Okay. In the north, they're deflected to the right. That is to the right from the direction they're coming. Okay, so they're flowing southward. That's the northeast trade. So you wind up with winds flowing out of the northeast and the southeast in the Hadley cells, and you wind up with your westerlies. Okay, the regions of the ocean okay, that sit beneath these wind systems are affected by the relative humidity of the air that's flowing over them. So when you take a look at this zone, we have the ITCZ, of course, we're having a lot of precipitation here. And in areas where we have air sinking, okay, that should be our dry areas. So where would you expect to find the highest salinity in the oceans? Where would you expect to find it? Right, it's right underneath the downwelling limbs of the Ferrell and the Hadley cells over here. Okay, and when we take a look at these regions, what we also find is these regions, here's 30 degrees, tend to be, as Jim pointed out, these big gyre systems, okay? These are very stable ecosystems. They've been around for millions of years, all right? And the circulating ocean systems, okay, in the South Atlantic and the North Atlantic are bounded by the currents that you've typically heard of, the Gulf Stream the Kuroshio, the Humboldt cur current coming up through Peru, okay? What current's this one? Everybody knows this one. They better know it. I bet every single one of you has seen Finding Nemo, okay? There's your East Australian current, okay? So what we have are a series of currents that bound these central regions. And if you look at the latitude and just find your desert belt and you, find, you cross along, you find out the centers of these gyres are sitting right underneath the 30 degree, that basically downwelling limbs that are really, really dry air. So you should see your highest salinity in those regions, and that's exactly what you see. Everything's predictable once you have the atmospheric circulation in your head. So if we look now latitudinally, this is, we flipped our, we have a polar reversal here. This is 50 north, 50 south. Okay, you see that underneath the 30 degree, underneath the gyres, we have our highest salinity where evaporation exceeds precipitation. And at the equator, where we have the ITCZ and a lot of precipitation, we have our lowest salinity. Okay, precipitation exceeds evaporation. So, when you take a look at this, you see exactly what you would expect to see. Now, where would you expect to see the highest delta O18 values? in the ocean at the surface, the highest. What? ITCZ. You guys, you guys agree to ITCZ? Okay, remember, we're talking about seawater. What happens in the ITCZ region? All right, so you want zones where it's evaporating to get the highest delta 18 values. Central of the gyres, exactly. That's exactly what we find. We find that the highest delta O18 values that we find are sitting right in the central of the gyres. Okay. And the region that, these regions where we find this, okay, is, allows us to effectively use the geochemistry of seawater, okay, to get at what's going on hydrologically out in the open ocean even without any sensors out there. Okay, so we see our highest delta O18 values sitting in the gyres, and we get our lowest delta O18 values associated with the ITCZ, and where else might you find low delta O18 values? You can sort of see it on this picture, the, the yellowish colors. You know, what's going on right there? Yeah, it's the Amazon runoff. So any place that you're gonna have the, ge the, the water, the ocean affected by river runoff, you're gonna have depleted delta O18 values offshore from that region. Very important from the viewpoint of oxygen isotope 
geochemistry is that unlike the meteoric waterline, there is no global salinity delta O18 water line, so to speak. And the reason is that when you take a look at the oxygen isotopic composition of seawater from different locations, okay, you get these really beautiful relationships, all right? So I would say the R squares of these are upwards of 0 0.95, 0 0.98. Okay, but you can see we wind up with a variety of different relationships. And given these straight lines of uh, y equals mx plus b, what is the y-intercept on these lines? What's the y-intercept? What's b? The source of what? The, uh, the source of what? Which, which water? Remember, this is a two end member mixing model. Okay, one end member is open ocean. What's the other end member? Fresh water, right? So every one of these lines is giving you information about the geochemistry of the fresh water, the precipitation, the runoff in an area. So if you take a look at where these are coming from, if you look up in the open ocean up here, these sort of open diamonds, what you find is that the y intercepts. This, ha this turns out to be, by the way, the open diamonds turns out to be the Sargasso Sea, the Gulf Stream, your open ocean, minus three per mil. What is minus three? That's your Hawaii water and your Fiji water. It's basically your source water is precipitation, okay? There's no fractionation. You basically have fractionation going up and you have precipitation coming down. There hasn't been any Rayleigh fractionation applied to that fresh water. But as you move out to these open triangles, you have a value of minus 35. Where's minus 35 coming from? Y-intercept, fresh water, minus 35? East Greenland. That's the Greenland ice sheet melt. That's the source of the fresh water in that region. So it's really important when you get into the ocean to be aware of the fact we don't have a global me meteoric salinity line, okay? That you have to be aware of the fresh water contributing to that two end member mixing model, and it varies quite a lot depending on where you are latitudinally and longitudinally. Yes? But the regional and like local lines are still valid? Well, yeah, in a given region, then you have a valid line. So if you were to um, go off to uh, San Francisco, or you go down to uh, Southern California, or you go down, for that matter, to Panama, okay, the fresh water that's flowing into the ocean at those locations. All right, is a function of Rayleigh fractionation that happens in the headlands up above how much fr the water is fractionated, but you'll wind up with a relationship that gives you that freshwater red member. So if you can reconstruct any of these somehow with corals, with foraminifera and things like that, you can now get backtrack what was going on with respect to E versus P up in the, uh, up in the terrestrial environment that's contributing the fresh water to that uh, source, to that region. That's actually an interesting way to take a look at trying to solve a, a very difficult problem in the past. How has evaporation and precipitation changed terrestrially um, as you go back through time? Okay, so um, when you take a look at this plot now and you look at these regions, there's something else that should jump out at you now. Look at the numbers, okay? So if you look at the Atlantic, you see that you're getting salinities out here at 37 parts per thousand, 36, 35 and a half. That pretty much describes everything from about 50 north to 50 south. Now look at the Pacific, 33, 34, 35, 36. The Atlantic's saltier than the Pacific. Okay, it turns out it's about 10% saltier. All right, this is actually a very, very interesting problem because when you look at the Caribbean and the, North, and the North Atlantic over here, and then you look at the Pacific, it really jumps out at you at how large the salinity difference is. Now, mind you, this salinity difference exists because of geology, I will tell you as a starter. And I will also tell you that, I'll give you a hint as to what's going on. Um, it's only really existed for the past four million years. Prior to that, there was no salinity difference between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Okay, why? Panama. Huh? Panama. Panama, okay. 
So what is it about Panama? What did pa the, the uplift of Panama that separated the Atlantic and the Pacific? Why should the salinities be different it's now? Okay, exchange of water, how? Hmm? Right, exchange of water, how? how? How do we maintain a difference today between the Atlantic and the Pacific? And Karina can't answer this because she knows the answer from my, from my graduate class. Uh, how do you maintain a difference in the, between the Atlantic and the Pacific? What do you have to do to make the Atlantic saltier? Hmm? Okay, you close it, but okay, you close it off. How do you maintain? Remember, this is four million years ago. You have to maintain it somehow. All right, so what's happening that maintains this difference? What do you have to do to make the Atlantic saltier? Okay, you got to evaporate water, but you got to put it somewhere. Where do you put it? Okay, it goes in the atmosphere, but you know, it doesn't help if it, if it evaporates here and it falls here. You kind of like it's a net sum game of zero. Okay, all right, so where, so where is that watershed? Okay, that's the question I'm ultimately getting at. How do you get water from the Atlantic to the Pacific? It's, obvious, it's pretty obvious when you take a look at the map, but how do you get water from the Atlantic to the Pacific? You can't take it under South America. That doesn't work because the currents don't flow that way. Over the land? Yeah, where? Because I, well, over the land where? How do you get it from the Atlantic to the Pacific? Um, well, it turns out that the further north you get, you have a problem because that's the westerlies and it's blowing this way, okay? But think of the trade winds over here. With the trade winds blowing, all right, what are we doing? Huge amounts of evaporation in the Atlantic and the tropical regions, and then these winds are just slamming into this beautiful mountain range that went up. What, what type of terrestrial ecosystems do you have here? What's the dominant ecosystem? Huh? Come on, what's the dominant ecosystem in Panama and Costa Rica? Rainforest. rainforest. It's called a rainforest for a reason, okay? Because it rains all the time. And it turns out because of this mountain range, it doesn't take much to get over the continental divide, so to speak, and have a huge amount of the water that's evaporating over here spill into the Pacific. And the flux of water vapor from the Atlantic and the Pacific has to be great enough. It turns out it's huge to be maintained by the fact that the ocean's currents hate imbalance and they're trying to rebalance this salt difference between the Atlantic and the Pacific. So effectively, your flow is going over here and that's why you have this low salinity sitting right in the Panama Basin, okay? Because so much fresh water is flowing out into the Panama Basin. Okay, so we're going to come back to this because now we have to figure out how to rebalance it because obviously the more this happens, if we didn't have a way to rebalance it, the salinity difference would just get greater and greater. And that's not what happens. We've had pretty constant salinity for about 3 million years now.